May the precious grace of Jesus Christ our Lord and His Word dwell within your hearts this day and each day. Amen. There's a song from the 60s, a song that's written by a guy by the name of Sam Cooke, that's, that the title is, The Best Things in Life Are Free. Now, admittedly, I, until recently, had never actually heard this song. In fact, in truth, I heard many adaptations of this song. But when Sam Cooke originally sang this song in 1964, I believe, he sang this song about the best things in life that are free, and he was talking about the moon and the stars, the sun and the flowers, and of course, love. He liked to talk about the beautiful things that are free. And that's how he closed his song and how he opened his song. But we know in this world that we live in that very little is free. In fact, we have a term that we are a phrase that we often say in, to counteract this. There is no such thing as a free lunch, right? We've heard this phrase before. Many of us do not actually know where this quote comes from. But if you know your history, you realize that this phrase, there's no such thing as a free lunch, actually comes from the 1930s. Uh, as you know, this, these were poor economic times. And uh, during this time, bars, American bars, would offer to people free lunch with their purchase of alcoholic beverages. There's no such thing as a free lunch, though, as we know today. It talks about that nothing in life comes for free. Even those sandwiches that were made... They cost money. We know that nothing in this life seems to be free. But which is it? Which is it for us? When we talk about the gospel, is it that the best things in life are free? Or is it that there's nothing in life that is free? When we talk about the gospel, it's a bit of a quandary, isn't it? Because we know that the answer is actually yes. On one hand, we know that the gospel is free. It is free to be proclaimed. We have been freely given it. In fact, Jesus even said to the disciples in Matthew chapter 10, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely you shall give. The best things in life are free. And yet on the other hand, we know that, well, the other is true, that the gospel in no way was free. It wasn't cheap. It wasn't easy. In fact, as we talk about the gospel message, we know that it cost Jesus his very life. It cost him as he came down from heaven, took on human flesh. He had to give his very body and blood for us. We know that even the disciples who passed on this message freely, that it cost them. Their lives were martyred for the sake of the gospel. All but John, the apostles. We know that even Paul, who wrote our our epistle letter today, that it was no free gift there. In fact, as he shared that gospel freely, he had to do so from a prison. And it wasn't just a house prison, which maybe sometimes we get an idea because we do know that for a time he was imprisoned in a house. But in fact, as he wrote the letter to the Philippians, the letter to the people of Philippi, it was a letter that he wrote from a prison, from a dungeon. In fact, this dungeon called Mamertine Prison Well, it was little more than a hole in the ground. It was a cistern that had been converted over where they were chained to the walls. Very little light. And yet he wrote those words of the gospel. He wrote those words of comfort and strength. He wrote those words that we're going to see not only this week, but next week as we see God's comfort coming to his people. God's word coming to his people. And the gospel message, as free as it is to share, as free as it is for we have been commanded to share, it was not free. It cost a great deal. And we know this. I don't think I'm telling you guys anything new. I don't think I'm repeating something that you, that, you, that you haven't heard before. Because you guys are members of the church. You know that this gospel cost. You know that it is free to give. And yet, and yet we still come back to that question. Well, is, it really, is there really no such thing as a free lunch? Is it really true that that gospel is free to give? So many people in the world, I think, reject it because they think to themselves, what's the catch? This is too good to be true. How many times have you heard the words of the gospel message? Have you heard them spoken and you realize that you were undeserving? You realize that these words were too good to be true for you. Think about your lives. Think about who you are. You people are sinners. I am a sinner. Those words of the gospel seem to be too good to be true. Now we talk about the fact that, well, we're well beyond that. We had Martin Luther who preached well about, about works righteousness and said, well, there's nothing that we need to do. And yet this keeps showing up in the church, doesn't it? 
in the church, in the world. This message of the gospel, this forgiveness of sins, this free grace that's been given to us. How can it be free? We may not outward ask that question, but we may be asked it in different ways. We say to ourselves things like, if, if I am saved, shouldn't my life look different? Shouldn't I behave different? Shouldn't I stop doing those things that I once did before I was saved? Instead of looking at the things that we do to become saved, we look at the things that we should be doing now that we are saved. We put it back on ourselves and we start to reassess things and say, well, how can I be deserving? We hear those words of the absolution, I forgive you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But in the next breath we think to ourselves, do I deserve that forgiveness? We're all sinners. We've all been sinning since the time that we were conceived. We're all sinners. And we've all broken God's law. In fact, as we look at our lives, we know that there's no time where we are free from that sin. As we think about ourselves, how many of us can truly say that we deserve that forgiveness of sins? How many of us can truly look at our lives and say, I deserve what God is giving me? Well, we know the answer is none of us. And yet we still, we, we still struggle with those conditions. We still struggle because it's an easy road to get on. It's an easy road to start saying to ourselves, well, I should be doing good things now that I am saved. I should be carrying out these good works. I, my life should look different. I should no longer intentionally sin. And even, as though, even though we know we should and what we shouldn't do, we notice that our lives, it's still, we still sin. We know these words of the gospel, but we struggle with that word. Freely we have received. Freely we have received this gift and freely it has been given to us. We struggle because there's no such thing as a free lunch. We've been conditioned by our world, by our society to question everything. To question every gift that we're given. What's the hidden motive? What's the catch on this one? And I encourage you to think of your own life right now for a moment. Think about those things that you have done wrong. Think about those ways where you have failed to keep God's law. And still Jesus says, I forgive you. And still Jesus gives you that promise that he will forgive you each and every time. No matter how many times you have repeated that sin. No matter how how undeserving you are. He repeats that same thing. I forgive you. Because it's not about who we are. It's not about what we have done because we are unworthy. We are undeserving. But it is about what He has done. It is about the Word being made flesh and coming into the world. It is about Jesus Christ taking our place and paying the price for our sins. That Word that Jesus used, freely you have received, freely you have given. It is a Greek word and I I really enjoy actually the, the, the other definitions beyond freely. Because I think it helps to open to us what, what, what was, he was really saying. In that word, he was saying, Dorion is the word, by the way. He was saying to us, without cause, undeserving, or even in vain. Many would say that Jesus came in vain because so many people rejected him. Many would say that we're a lost cause, this world the people of this world. And he still came as a babe in the Bethlehem. Everyone would say, including ourselves, we are undeserving. And he made us deserving. That is the power of God's word in our lives. And that is the power of the gospel that dwells among us. That is the power of the Holy Spirit that continues to work in us each day. That we, poor, miserable sinners, are still forgiven. Even as often as we must confess our sins, that the word of God makes us alive. As often as we hear those words, I forgive you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are forgiven. When the word is combined with water as it poured over a child's head, the forgiveness of sins is imparted to them. And the name of the Lord is written on their hearts. As often as we kneel before the altar of the Lord, eating of the bread and drinking of the wine, we know combined with the Word of God that it is not simply bread and wine, but it is the forgiveness of sins and the strengthening of our faith. And that Word of God is not weak. It is not impotent. It is powerful. We hear about John the Baptist today. And if you were with us on Wednesday, then you heard about the tough message he had to proclaim. 
And it was tough, wasn't it? Because he even knew how unworthy he was to proclaim that message. He knew that he was a poor, miserable sinner. He knew that his lips were unclean, as Isaiah the prophet said. He knew that the message he had was going to be unpopular and it was going to be different. I mean, how many of you want to tell someone, you brood of vipers? Does that instill a warm, fuzzy feeling inside of you? Because it doesn't inside of me. But that is the message he had to proclaim. And we unworthy Christian people, God has given us a message to proclaim. He has given us a message of salvation to proclaim that there is indeed sin in this world. That we have indeed failed to keep His law. That we have indeed struggled to bear the burdens of this life and given in to our sinful human nature. But we have that Word of God. That Word to apply to the hearts of sinners who are convicted of their sins. We have that Word that is much like the doctor who applies the salve to the wound and brings healing. The Word of God is powerful and it brings healing. The Word of God is what we are given to share. And it brings healing. We are unworthy people. We we are not worthy to untie the sandals of Christ, but He has made us worthy. We are undeserving, but He has made us deserving. We are imperfect, but He has made us perfect before God, our Heavenly Father. And He has called us to share this message. He has called us to proclaim this powerful Word in our communities, in our families, in our churches, around the world. He has called us to proclaim not that hard message that John had to say, that message that drifts tore people apart, but the message of hope and comfort, the message that brings true comfort during this Christmas season, this Advent season as we prepare for the coming of our Lord. This is the message of Jesus Christ that He does forgive, that He does heal the broken heart, that He does save, and it doesn't matter how many times you have failed. It doesn't matter what sins you have committed. People, there are people out there who have committed atrocities that we would rank in the world. There are rapists, there are murderers, there are child molesters, there are people who have destroyed other people's life, and God says to them, I forgive you. And that is a task that we we don't envy, is it? Because we are sinful people and we could never offer that forgiveness. We are sinful people and we could never step out there and say those words. But God in His mercy pours out His blood upon them. God in His mercy, He says those words, I forgive you and I have cleansed you and made you clean. I have not held that sin against you. And that is the power of the Word of God is it brings life to the dead. And it brings salvation to the damned. Thanks be to God for that mercy, for that grace. And thanks be to God that He has given us that mission to share it. Because as we stand here, as we sit here today, we realize there are so many people who have not heard it. We realize that there are so many people who are convicted by their sins and they do not have the hope. And there's a great many people who are not convicted by their sins as well. And those people still need the Gospel message. They need to know that the sins that they have committed, that our God in heaven will forgive them. That our God who took on human flesh and came down to the earth will wash away their sins. See, the Word of God is not something that is an old book that we dust off. The Word of God is not simply words on a page that are bound in a beautiful leather binding with golden prints on the cover. But the Word of God is Jesus Christ among us. The Word of God is Emmanuel. God is with us. And He is our salvation. So often we say those words, I can't. I can't be the one. We fear for persecution. Maybe not physical persecution, but we feel, fear for persecution that are either economical, economic or social. We fear for the persecution that may come politically. But we need not be afraid. Because the Word of God is the everlasting promise of salvation. The Word of God transcends this life. It transcends this world and it leads us to life eternal. That Word of God, it is more powerful than the empty words that we might say. That Word of God is the powerful name of Jesus Christ. So often we say those words, I can't. I don't have the words to say. I don't know what I would tell someone if I approached them. Then don't. Let the Holy Spirit speak through you. 
Let the Holy Spirit use your heart and use your life to change other hearts, to change other people's lives. As we prepare for the coming of our Savior, the Word made flesh among us, as we prepare for that time, we prepare by giving away His hope, His comfort this season. We prepare by giving that gospel message. Not when we're ready. Not when we feel prepared. But in, in season and out. We give that message away now so that all may come to be with Him forever. Freely we have been given. Freely we have received. And freely we give. Amen. Please pray with me. Gracious Lord, we thank you for sending your son Jesus, who is the word made flesh among us. We thank you that he has conquered sin, that he has conquered death, and that he has declared war on the devil, and that he and the battle has already been won. We thank you, O Lord, that Jesus has come into our lives, that he has given us that forgiveness of sins, that he gives us that forgiveness each day. We pray, O Lord, that we would trust in you that we would trust in you enough to know that this free gift is one that is meant to be shared. That this free gift is not meant to be bound up in the pages of Scripture, but is meant to be poured out in the lives of many. Lord, pour it out in our lives. Pour it out in the lives of those around us that all may know the knowledge of the truth. Lord, stir up in us your hope and your comfort even in this Advent season that all may come to the knowledge of the truth. And Lord, help us to trust in you. Help our fainting hearts to trust in you and know your power. And to know that nothing is impossible with you. And know that even to the very ends of the earth, that your word might go forth. And that it might cleanse the hearts of the wicked to bring them to life eternal. That all may know you. And may know the forgiveness of sins. That all may know the promise that one day we will be with you forever in heaven. That you will come again with all your glory with all your honor and with all your power and might. And you will call your church to you and you will call us home, your sons and your daughters. And so in all things we pray in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen and amen.